Free markets don't give us perfect solutions, but they do give us far better solutions than we get when we attempt to manipulate markets. I'm Anthony Davies, Associate Professor of Economics at Duquesne University and co-host of the podcast Words and Numbers. I'm here at LibertyCon in Miami answering the most Googled questions about economics. If the economy is in a recession, the government should stop doing whatever it's doing to contribute to the recession. One of the things that happens is anytime something bad happens to the economy, we ask the question, what can the government do? We almost never ask the question, what can the government stop doing? Because what we'll find is that in a lot of cases, the problem that we're identifying here that needs fixing is itself the result of government action. I give you a good example. One of the things that we were very concerned about going into the years of Obamacare was that there were many Americans who would become sick They'd lose their jobs because they couldn't work. In losing their jobs, they would lose their health insurance. And then they couldn't get new health insurance because they had a pre-existing condition, this, this disease, this malady that caused them to lose their jobs in the first place. And the problem there, of course, is that our health insurance comes through our employers. If we did health insurance like we do car insurance or home insurance, you get it separate, it would have nothing to do with your employer. If you lose your job, your insurance is still there. The pre-existing condition isn't a problem. So we ask the government, come in and do something about this pre-existing condition problem. Well, let's go back in history a little bit because round about the end of World War II, we were concerned in this country about rising prices, inflation, and one of the things that the government did is it encouraged businesses to put a cap on wages. So if businesses weren't raising wages, that would help contribute to prices of goods being not rising as much, and that would help to control, the thought was, the inflation. And what do you do if back in the 1940s you're an employer and you want to you hire more people? The way you hire more people typically is you offer them more money, and they come and work for you. But you can't offer more money because the government stepped in and said, no, no, you're not allowed to raise your wages. So what did entrepreneurs do? They came up with a solution. And the solution was, they said, all right, I can't pay you more money than you're making now, but how about if I provide you with health insurance? And what happened was, Congress said, okay, Mr. Employer, you're providing health insurance to your employees. We're not gonna count that as part of the cap. You can go ahead and do that. In fact, we'll make it tax-free. So when the employee earns money, wages, that gets taxed. But if the employee gets health benefits from the employer, that's not taxed. And what happened is we set up this system in which both the employer and the employee would rather get the health insurance through the employer. And that caused the pre-existing condition problem. And so we come up to the 2010s where we're saying, what do we do about pre-existing conditions? And the first thing we do is we ask, what can the government do to fix it? Nobody asked, what did the government do to cause it? If we'd asked that question, we could have come up with a solution much sooner. Why do people say it's the economy stupid? <laughs> because that's what it is, right? When we interact with each other, you have friends or maybe you have um, a spouse or you have kids, you have social interactions. And this is how we interact with various people. But there's another type of interaction and with this second type of interaction, we interact with way more people than we do with the social or familial interactions. And that second set of interactions are economic. So I go to the store and I buy something, and you might look at that and say, well, that's an interaction just between you and the grocer. It's really not. It's between me and the grocer and the people who work for the grocer and all the people, the farmers who provided the goods that come to the grocer, the truckers who move the goods from the farms to the grocer, all of, I'm interacting with all of those people. Now I'm interacting with them indirectly through the grocer, but the interaction is there. And so when we say, it's the economy stupid, what we mean is, here we are human beings in society interacting, and the bulk of our interactions, although we're not aware of it, occur in the economic sphere. And so to the extent that the economy is running smoothly, the government is doing what it should do, which is protecting and forcing property rights, but otherwise leaving people alone to come up with their own solutions to problems. 
what is the importance of free markets to economics? In a sense, economics is about free markets. When we talk about people's incentives and their behaviors, which is the focus of economics, we're talking about how they interact in markets. And if they aren't interacting freely, then whatever interaction's going on is not really reflecting the people's choices. Rather, it's, it's reflecting the constraints that we have artificially imposed upon them. And so when we ask questions like, what would happen if we raise the minimum wage to $20 an hour? That's not a free market solution. You'd get people responding to that, but they would be responding often in ways that we didn't anticipate, in ways that actually we'd not like. For example, the first thing employers are gonna do is look around and say, okay, I've gotta pay my workers $20 an hour. Who's worth $20 an hour? Every employee who's worth $20 an hour keeps his job, he earns $20 an hour. Every employee who isn't loses his job, and he goes from whatever he was making, $12 an hour, to zero. And all of a sudden, we've got a group of permanently unemployed people. Why? Because we didn't let markets do their thing. Now, if you leave the markets alone, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get some people who are earning $5 an hour. And we can look at that and say, that's horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. But raising a minimum wage doesn't fix that problem. It hides it. Because if my labor's only worth $5 an hour, and you force someone to pay me 20, they're simply not going to hire me. And you can feel good about what you've done, that people are now earning $20 an hour, when in fact all you've done is hidden the most vulnerable people in the workforce. This is why free markets are so important. They don't give us perfect solutions, but they typically give us far better solutions than you get when we try and manipulate markets. Free markets don't give us perfect solutions, but they do give us far better solutions than we get when we attempt to manipulate markets. What are supply and demand? This is a very strange thing, and I probably spend the first class in principles economics answering this question, because most people, when they think about supply, they think, how much stuff is there? And when they think about demand, they think, how much stuff do I want? And people will tend to use the terms supply and demand like that. In economics, that's not what supply and demand mean. In economics, supply is not how much stuff there is. It's a relationship between the price of the product and the amount of stuff sellers are willing to bring to the market. And demand is not how much stuff you want. It's the relationship between the price of the product and how many units you'd be willing to buy at those various prices. So when economists use the term supply and demand, don't think quantity of stuff, think relationships. How does taxation affect the economy? There are two answers here. The first is, anything you tax, you're gonna get less of. So if you tax smartphones, you'll get less smartphones being produced and bought. If you tax labor, you're going to get less labor hours produced and hired. Anything you tax, you'll get less of, no matter how you tax it, no matter what it is. But the second answer is this. To have truly free markets requires government. Now, it requires government with a very light touch. That is, in a free market environment, there are property rights. That requires that we have some agreement as to what those property rights are. That requires a Congress, a legislature, to come up with these rules. We have to have somebody who's going to enforce the property rights. That requires an executive branch with police who can come in and say, no, you're not allowed to do this. This goes against the rules. It requires people who are impartial to look at conflicts of property rights and be able to say, this property right takes precedence over that one, or you have indeed violated this property right, or you have not, and that requires a judiciary. That is, to have a system of free markets requires a government, although I would argue it requires a government that is minuscule compared to governments that we have today. And that's the second answer to the question of what do taxes do to an economy? Taxes enable a government to exist in the first place, which enables the 
definition of property rights, the enforcement of property rights, and the judging of property rights. Is being an economist worth it? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's an answer for each individual. Because as with anything in life, you get two things out of a job. One is the pay, and the other is the joy of doing what you were clearly built to do. And so you'll find um, many people who are working in economics, making plenty of money, and you would point to those people and say, it must be worth it. And yet those people would be much happier doing something else. And from their perspective, maybe it's not worth it. Or you'll see other people who maybe aren't earning much money in economics. You point to them and say, well, that's clearly not worth it. But if you ask them, they'll say, but this is what I love. This is what I do. And for them, it is very much worth it. And so we come back to this question that applies to human beings everywhere. What is it that you want and what constraints are you facing? And if you can achieve the thing that you want within the context of your constraints, then by definition for you, whatever it is you're doing, that's worth it. Does economics involve math? Math is a language that economists use largely because it takes away the ambiguity of words and you find the ambiguity all over the place from day one of economics when an economist says supply and demand and virtually every non-economist in the room hears something different. And this goes on and on with all sorts of words that economists use. There's ambiguity there. And even when we use the words correctly, there can be ambiguity. The mathematics takes that away and we can speak much more clearly and concisely. And so we'll use mathematics as a tool when we actually do the economics. But when it comes to explaining the economics or understanding it at a gut level, there the mathematics does less good. There you want intuition. And I would advise anyone who's interested in economics and loves mathematics to go study it at a place that specializes in mathematical economics. Anybody who loves economics and doesn't care for mathematics that much, go study it in a place that specializes in philosophy, politics, and economics because there you'll get an understanding of economics at a gut level, at an intuitive level. You won't be able to do the high level economics that economists do, but you will be able to understand it. And I think under some circumstances, maybe understand it better than the people who are doing the high level mathematical economics. What makes capitalism most able to lift people out of poverty? This is a superb question because the answer is it's not capitalism that lifts people out of poverty. It's people who lift people out of poverty. Everything from the poor person who says, I've got to do better and goes and figures out how he can make his labor more valuable to an employer, to entrepreneurs who have an idea for a new product or a new way of doing things, and they say, if I do this, people will buy it, and they do it, and people buy it, and they start hiring new people and providing jobs for all sorts of people, all the way up to the people in government who hopefully make prudent laws that help to enforce property rights and help to make transactions run more smoothly. All of those people are the people who contribute to lifting us up out of poverty. What's important about a capitalist system or a free market system is that in that system, we give those people the maximum opportunity to do what they do. In a free market system, every one of those individuals can do whatever he or she chooses, provided they aren't imposing harm on anyone else. And given that we don't know what the right answers are in raising people out of poverty and solving problems like healthcare or living wages, given that we don't know the answers to that, in a free market environment, in a capitalist system, we're unleashing 300 million people and encouraging them to find answers to those problems wherever they are. The most difficult question I have ever faced as an economist, the question I've struggled with most, and I continue to struggle with it, is the question, is there a role for government in an economy at all? For a long time, I was of a mind that we didn't need government, that everything that government does could be done 
not only by markets, but could be done better by markets. The more I study public choice economics, the more I come to the conclusion that government is necessary, although perhaps necessary only in this very limited space of helping to define, enforce, and adjudicate property rights. In that space, government seems to be, at least under current circumstances, indispensable. Now, I put a big footnote on all of this. I think still there's an opportunity for anarchy, that is, a state in which there is no government. But it requires a fundamental change, and interestingly, the fundamental change has nothing to do with economics, it has nothing to do with politics, it has to do with us. When humans evolve to the point that we individually respect each other, we consider each other's needs as much as we consider our own, at that point, government's no longer necessary because each of us will police him or herself. And that becomes the ultimate in free markets.